Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I want to just, um, I want to just put at least uh, one more additional talk into um, the two that we've already uh, gone through for the last two weeks, which is straight lines in the crooked world. And uh, I want to build the story a little bit further for you because I think uh, I think it's it's. Uh, very important. Now, last week we talked about the critical importance of not just recognizing there is such a thing as spirit, okay? Because we talked about flesh. Do you remember? Remember the Greek word for that was sarx. So we had praise the Lord, you sarxy thing. Where's he getting from? It's like the one I have the heart of a lion and a lifetime ban from London Zoo. It's not just about recognizing there is such a thing as spirit, but, but, but you need to understand that when we deny that, the reality of spirit as a dimension of life, we diminish truth and we rob ourselves of a vital ingredient in the quest for wholeness and fulfillment. Now, I'm not going to go back and talk about all that we talked about um, last week or the week before. That's all available online. You can access that, and I don't have the time to to revisit that today, except for a couple of things that relate to where I want to leave this. If spirit is so important as a dimension in life, in the quest for wholeness and fulfillment, then it makes sense that there are writings in the New Testament which address the issue of flesh and spirit. Now, it doesn't address the issue from a negative perspective. It addresses the issue from a positive perspective because you will never cease to be flesh. But you will also always have a spirit. So the issue is not what some people in ancient times, particularly springing out of Greek mythology, uh, of, of Greek, Greek philosophy tried to do, which was to separate the two and say the two don't come together. So there's carnal and spiritual, which is, which is a development of a thought that's known as dualism, the issue of Scripture is telling us we have this thing called flesh and this thing called flesh wants to do stuff and just because it wants to do stuff, that's not necessarily wrong, okay? There are certain drives and needs that are in our flesh that are, are not wrong, but they are part of the, the flesh that unless you understand that there's also spirit and that those two things have to be united for wholeness and it's when flesh and spirit are brought together that we experience wholeness. The great example of this, of course, is in the incarnation of Christ. He was born in human flesh. The spirit was within him. And when spirit and flesh came together, we have the Christ of God. Okay? We have incarnation, the word made flesh living among us. And so that's the, that's the equation that we are dealing with. Now, of course, if we don't recognize flesh and spirit have to be brought together, then that leaves us in the position that we talked about last week that Paul describes in Galatians chapter 5 from verse 19, of which I love the message version of this scripture. And I'm going to read it again because I, want, I need to make a comment about it further to last week. Here's, here's what he writes in the message, verse 19. It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time which tends to be the main focus of this thing called flesh. Because if you think flesh is all about me, it's all about number one, it's all about my comfort, what people think of me, what I get, the entitlement. So, so flesh is the core from which springs our own selfishness. So he says it's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to do that which is getting your own way all the time. And this is what he says. I'll give you the things. I won't make a lot of comment on them tonight. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. A stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage. Frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness. Trinket gods. Magic show religion. Paranoid loneliness. 
cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, and the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, and ugly parodies of community. I could go on, Paul says, okay? Um, so he gives us what I think is some, some fascinating examples that I think Peterson makes incredibly, incredibly clear, and I'm not going to explain them, as I said, because they kind of speak for themselves. But I do know that in talking about this, I caused concern among some of you last week who felt that I may be returning you to law and the performance-based gospel that demands perfection for reward and is mostly based on a critical approach to life, okay? Like that old gospel that was all about, always seemed to be about what you didn't do. It was about what you do and don't do, but mostly about what you don't do. Um, but I want you to know this was not Paul's original concern, it was not Paul's original intent, nor is it my intent. Actually, in this scripture, he is still advocating freedom. Okay? And so am I. If you look at each of these things positively rather than defensively, you will see what I mean. Now, we live, for some of you older ones, and I, I risk my reputation here perhaps with some of you, we live in a different world. You know, I told you that, that my, my grandfather was, was the illegitimate son of a servant girl and was born in, in Hemsworth Workhouse. And he was never adopted by the, the man that his mother then married. So he always carried the Chapman name, not the Hayward name, which meant that the shame that belonged to him as the illegitimate child of Elizabeth Chapman was never lifted of him. And that there was an element of that that I have understood has run through our family line uh, because my name, Chapman, is a maternal name, and that's where it came from. It came out of the workhouse. It came out of rejection. It came out of a family not wanting to own their daughter or the child that their daughter brought into the world of a husband she married who didn't want to adopt the child to become his child because that child was the child of shame. And, and all these things that, that come through with us um, that, that, that affect our life are, are, are so interesting, but... But um, uh, if, if we look at these things, the issue is that the point I was going to make is this. We live in a world now where you're not likely to be shamed for getting pregnant outside of marriage, and rightly so. Rightly so. Not going to be rejected. And uh, we're also in a world where the whole status of marriage uh, has taken on new challenges. And uh, I'm, okay with, I'm okay with that in one sense because uh, I, I know that a certificate doesn't make a marriage. Okay? Uh, and uh, when you're a pastor and you counsel people, you realize that, that uh, the term marriage is sure, purely a legal statement in some people's, some people's connection. The point I'm making is this, that as a leader, um, there has to be some understanding of the cultural... Uh, state of the time. What, is the, what are the cultural values? And there should still be values, and values shouldn't be devalued, but sometimes things that, that as a person becoming older you can think are not values are actually held with great value by people who are just living a slightly different way. So again, I, I risk getting into trouble for this, but there you go. Uh, because the one, the one that caused the most problems uh, is the repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. Now, now some, of, some of our people, and some are not here, some are in relationships and various situations, and we know that, and, and, and we walk with God through that and grace. But notice what Paul says. He says the problem is in, in repetitive, loveless, cheap sex. So to me, it's not difficult. If you're engaged in repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, that's who he's talking to, Okay. Uh, but we can mostly get touchy because the things that we're working through in our lives, we're so ready to think somebody is condemning us. When Paul's not actually condemning them, he's saying there needs to be some values. From where you are right now, there needs to be some values that come in. 
So if the cap fits, you've got to wear it. But the cap's actually quite clear. It's not an all-encompassing, anybody that gets it wrong is wrong and you should be condemned. Do you understand what I'm saying? Does that make sense? And the same with all the other stuff as well. So, so anyway, um, he, he goes on to say, this isn't the first time I have warned you. Uh, you know, and if you, use, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. I find it fascinating that he says if you use your freedom this way, right? Not if you use your sinfulness, not if you use your unrighteousness, but if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So what he's saying is that in Christ, because of the righteousness we have been given, there is a freedom because we don't earn righteousness with God. Righteousness is a revelation from God that touches our spirit. And when it comes into our lives, he said, the issue is this. Don't use the freedom that you have because you know there's no condemnation to do stupid things which are to allow the flesh side of you to dominate your life at the expense of the spirit side of you because if you just let the flesh operate without the work of the spirit touching it, these are the kind of dumb things that you'll find yourself doing. Now, I don't think that it means that God's going to damn you to eternal conscious torment forever and ever because and, that's a something that I struggle with anyway. But I do believe, absolutely, that this business of inheriting the kingdom of God, of experiencing the full measure of all that God will bring you by the Spirit, through your Spirit, into your life, we compromise when we allow the flesh in this way to dominate. So, so it's, it's about freedom, but it's about how you use that freedom. So, so... Um, it's the responsibility of any caring leader, which hopefully is me and Chris and the other guys who are worth their salt to warn of these things just like Paul did uh, because I believe they interfere with the flow of God's kingdom inheritance in your life. I absolutely believe that. So that's my reason not to heap condemnation but to hopefully bring you into a place where the full inheritance of the promise and the blessing of God is at work in your life. Now, I understand fully, of course, for some of you, the fear and criticism toward a gospel which seems to be based only on a bunch of do's and mostly don't. So I'm trying to walk through that with you and help you because that's not where I see the gospel or where we live. So I believe this, okay, that I had to say that. I'm clearing up last week now, okay? Flesh and spirit are to be brought together in Christ. That's the idea. Flesh and spirit are to be brought together in Christ, just like it was in Jesus, not separated from each other, so that verse 22 becomes the how this works understanding. Now, verse 22 is the core verse that we're talking about, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and then he adds this bit on which I love, against such there is no law. Or in other words, if you want an unstoppable force at work in your life, it will not come if you prefer what he calls the flesh and these obvious things. But when you begin to move and allow the spirit to be part of that and bring all this together, what happens is you flow in the arena of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and there's no law of the universe that can diminish or dilute or stop those. Now, we, we have been looking at the evolution of something over the weeks. The, the first one that we talked about was the one that was on at the beginning. If you can just throw that up, Robert. When I showed you, I'll show you this because some will have not seen this. Um, the question is, what is it that you see? Because it looks like what you're experiencing is a wheel of dots going around in a, in a bigger wheel. When actually, as I pointed out, that's not true. Uh, and so much of how we try to read life, we read the illusion of life rather than the truth of life. And we don't catch the reality. When the reality is, as those of you who are already here know, if you focus on one dot, any dot, pick a dot you will notice that dot is not going around anywhere. 
You can pick any other dot that you want and notice actually what you think is happening, those dots moving around inside the wheel, is not happening at all. What is happening is those dots are all going on a straight line from one extreme of the circle to the other extreme of the circle, but what it creates is a sense of movement. And your eye's picking up the movement, but if you don't understand what's creating the movement, how will you know what the movement is? But the movement is, is, is the dots going up and down the straight line. Okay, so then we evolve that into something else. And this is what we evolved that into. That that wheel is actually, let's call the wheel time. Okay, let's just call it time. The outer circle, let's call it time. The reason I want to call that time is because no Hebrew would have had a clue what you were talking about if you talked to them about time having a beginning here and an ending there. Because to the Hebrew mind, time was cyclical. It was like that. Time went around. I haven't time to talk about all that, but if you ever experience or see um, a Hebrew calendar, you will see it's always drawn in a circle because they believed time was cyclical. They actually also believed that, that the realm in which we live is, is a cycle of time, but, but eternity is also a cycle that, that is parallel with, with the time that we're in. So heaven is not that far away from earth. Touching the kingdom of God is not this thing that's miles away at an end of something. It's this thing that's present now, available, and you're able to touch it and reach it if you can understand how spirit and flesh connect. So we put these in and we put the nine spokes in as these nine fruits of the spirit. But we've, uh, we've now got the latest edition of that, which I'm going to show you in a minute, okay? Because we, we looked at these things, these nine fruits of the Spirit, as being the spokes in the wheel that we call time. That contain the movement that we call life. So if you think of our first image, if those are the spokes within what we call time, and the movement of the dots is what we call life, and it's all contained within that wheel, then all this is touched by the kingdom of heaven, which is like the tire on the wheel that makes the ride possible at the point where the rubber hits the road. How many of you are familiar with that term, where the rubber hits the road? Okay, That's where the kingdom of God comes in. So, so these spokes are what we are going to call, from the Bible, the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? And so I want, I want to show you now how we've evolved that because there's an ingredient missing here that is very, very important. And that ingredient is the hub. So I want to talk to you about where we've now come to. Because each one of those, without that information, doesn't allow you to come into the revelation of what it's all about. So we've now got the dots, which is the motion. Let's call those moving dots life, right? Life moves, that's the motion of life. And then we have the outer circle, which is time. So within the context of time, life is moving. But then within this context, we have the spokes that hold the wheel, the love, joy, peace, gentleness, kindness, self-control, patience, goodness, faithfulness, all, all within the wheel, right, which are the spokes. But what we've got to look at is that, that each of these dots flows from one end to the other, okay? Have you noticed that? Each one of the dots, pick any line, it goes from one extreme to the other. Now, there's a good Bible term for this. It's called from everlasting to everlasting, right? So there's a psalm that says, from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. So, so if each of these dots are now tracing those lines which are the fruit of the Spirit, each of those things flows from everlasting to everlasting. They are not something that suddenly crops up in life because you did something or earned something or prayed something or wanted something. These nine things are flowing across the timelines of life all the time, never ending, from everlasting to everlasting. So there is an everlasting love that you don't have to earn or say, I wish God loved me and I wish I could love. There is a, there's a love that's flowing through time, 
right from everlasting to everlasting, and the goodness and the kindness. And I, I thought it was also interesting because we talk about things like joy, uh, things like love, and kindness, but very often we wouldn't associate things like joy as being one of the essential things that actually you can connect with and get a hold of so that you have joy flowing in your life. Now, one of the most helpful things for me growing up as a young man was to learn the difference between joy and happiness. That happiness was something external that was dependent upon circumstance, but joy was something from within that was not affected by circumstance. So I realized I've lived most of my life running after happiness. And how many of you know that means you're happy one day, and the next day not so much? Because happiness is not one of the fruits of the Spirit. Happiness is just an outward emotion that we feel when things are in order. Joy is something that flows from everlasting to everlasting through every circumstance and situation. You need to read some time, take the time to read some of the story of the ancient martyrs of the Christian faith. And not just that they died or why they died, but how they died expressing incredible joy is fascinating. You have to say that obviously couldn't come from a happiness or unhappiness. Something was flowing. So all of these things are flowing from eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting, through our world, in our lives, and also they can flow in us and through us and from us. So, what I wanted to talk to you about tonight, having said some of that before, is that, is that if we go back, just take me back to that, previous wheel, um, Robert, if you could. If this is our model, it's incomplete. Because although we have the, the fruits of the Spirit, this love, joy, peace, etc., going from everlasting to everlasting, flowing through our world, there is an instability built into that system. And the instability is this that they themselves can become crooked or distorted, or distorted because one vital element is missing. If you were to create a wheel and to put spokes in it like that, the wheel would not be stable. You would find that the spokes would distort, they would bend, they would become crooked lines, not straight lines. And the problem is that in our world, we experience Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. But how many times do we witness that as crooked or distorted? Crooked love, distorted love. Distorted goodness. Faithfulness that's only faithfulness while it suits to be faithful that then bends away and distorts because there's no strength in the wheel from the spokes. There's a vital ingredient, a vital element that is missing to stop these spokes becoming crooked and distorted. And that vital element is the hub. You have to have a hub in the wheel. And if we said that the wheel is time, and these lines are what flows from everlasting to everlasting, to bring stability to that so it actually works, we have to have a hub. And this is very important because spokes without a hub have no stability and cannot stop the buckling effect whenever the wheel encounters a bump. So, I've met more people and I've been guilty of this myself, you know, trying to live in these elements of the fruit of the Spirit and I've hit a bump in my life and found the wheel of time has buckled that things have just gone into free fall and, and despair and, and confusion because in my wheel of time and existence, it's buckled, okay? It's twisted and it's buckled when I hit the bump. The reason for that is simply because the buckling effect takes place when the wheel doesn't have a hub. So they exist and they're in place, but they have no strength and they become bent or distorted or crooked without the context of the world into which they have been introduced. It's the hub that enables the spokes to do what the spokes are designed to do. Now, let me tell you why I'm teaching you this. I'll bring you back to something I said last week. How do spokes work? 
I love this. This is written by, a, a, obviously, a bike anorak. Because of his opening statement, how do spokes accomplish their terrific and heroic feat? I love that every time I read that, it makes me smile. I mean, who would write that about a bike? You know, how do spokes accomplish their terrific and heroic feat? But you see, he's just as passionate about this bike wheel because he's understood something about the dynamics and the strength and how it works that I am passionate about what I'm teaching you about these spokes of the fruit of the Spirit within the wheel of time where we operate our life because in the same way that the natural wheel needs a hub, this needs a hub. Listen to what he says first. Spokes don't push outward holding the rim at bay. The spokes are not there to push out so that the rim doesn't fall. And, and it can seem that way, but rather the rim is evenly pulled inward by the spokes. I love this when I read this. The purpose of spokes is to pull the hub inwards. Now, if you think that here, in the context of time, we have something that the Bible calls the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven within the context of the time that God has created is a kingdom time, right? It's a kingdom time, everlasting to everlasting. It's a kingdom time, and you think of that outer wheel that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is out here, and you understand that the purpose of spokes is actually, it's to pull the rim inwards, it's to pull the rim inwards, which in our context means that these spokes are always pulling the kingdom of God into life, they're pulling it into time, they're pulling it into space. The fruits of the Spirit are pulling the kingdom of God into our lives. That's why Paul says, don't get messed up with this flesh thing too much where you do stupid things because what you need to do is get these spokes in place because they will pull what it is you're looking for, the kingdom of God. They will pull it into your life all the time, constantly, in a constant tension, just like the spokes of a wheel. But here's the thing, they are laced through the hub, the center part of the wheel that rotates around the axle. Tension between the hub and the wheel is applied evenly in all directions, making the assembly extraordinarily strong, flexible, and resistant to shock. It's this uniformly applied tension is what supports you and the weight on the wheel. So what he's saying is that as these are connected to a hub in the middle, it's the hub that allows the tension of these things to make the assembly extraordinarily strong. It's weak without the hub. It can't do what it's supposed to do without the hub. So the ingredient we needed to add into our conversation, going from our first model to our second model and now into our third model, is this, that Christ is the hub in the wheel of time. The fruits of the Spirit are the spokes which connect through the hub, applying tension to pull the kingdom of God into life so that as we operate then in these things, the movement of our life is a movement that is in a constant flow of love and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and self-control and patience and goodness and faithfulness are what make the flow of our life. Our life flows in them and through them and upon them because what's happening in our life is straight lines in a crooked world which means an undeformed love, a real joy, a true patience. All of these things become a reality rather than the distortion that happens because we're trying to put those kind of things into a world where we don't have the hub. So in the process of time, they never work like they're supposed to do and they distort. But when you create the wheel this way, we have the kingdom of God always being pulled into the movement of life which moves all the time around the hub, which is Christ. Success in life is not governed by what you push away. It's governed by what you pull in. And too many times we think, if I can just push away the things in life that I think are a problem, I'll be okay. You never will. Just like the Linkin Park guy. You never will. You see, because life 
flourishes on what you pull into it, not what you push out of it. Because this is the process that is happening by the fruit of the Spirit. So what is the hub, that central necessary connecting point to which and through which all these good things flow? Let me read you one more scripture before we just begin to tie this together. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is God's selfie. The image of the invisible God. He is it. He said, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So anything that doesn't look like Jesus is not what the Father looks like. It's what religion looks like. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him, and he is before all things, listen, and in him all things hold together. That's what a hub does. A hub holds all things together. If you're going to hold all things together, they have to be around you because that's the only way you can hold all things together. So the time, the time, this thing of, of life, time, and the kingdom of God is all being held together by the hub which is Christ. In him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, which is the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all fullness dwell in him. So if Christ is the hub, all God's fullness is at the center of the wheel, which is my life. So some of you are still, you have, you have diminished your understanding of Christ at the center to Christ being some addition to our life, some, some good example, some good, good model uh, who, who we can involve a bit, like, you know, a bit like a pet dog at the time when you just need that little bit of comfort. When actually the message here is when Christ is the hub, when he is at the center, all God's fullness dwells in him. I, I want to bring us back having deconstructed so many things to understand that all God's fullness is in Christ and when Christ is at the center all God's fullness is right there in the center and that when with him at the center we live from the context not of judgments and condemnations and attempts at human perfection but in first of all the love the joy the peace the goodness, the patience, the kindness, the faithfulness, the self-control, the gentleness that flows from him. And we begin to express from our lives love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. All of that God that is in the middle can't help but flow. So it moves along those straight lines in a crooked world to give us all of that genuine thing and in that connection to the hub to pull the kingdom of God back into the center. And so he goes on to say, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The cross was a moment of reconciliation. A reconciliation between God and his creation. A correcting, a putting right, a restoring. So that you and I are invited to live life, you can, you can go from that now onto the thing, to live life like this model that we have put with Christ at the hub, the, the, the fruits of the Spirit being the spokes, the wheel being time, the kingdom of God being there, but from this immense center of power and strength and help with all the fullness of God dwelling there, the kingdom being pulled in, being pulled in, being pulled in, being pulled in. Now, have you know, people can't help but get helped and blessed when that is happening. When this is the culture that we create, when this is the community that we build, the kingdom of God is always being 
pulled in. Now, it doesn't mean that within the movement of life, which we have there, that there won't be some difficulties and some trials, but the issue is when those difficulties and trials are happening within this perspective of time and the kingdom of God, within those struggles and trials, you expect something to be pulled in that ultimately means that the kingdom of God shows up and God is honored and you see a miracle. I'm done with the, with the pessimistic thing of, well, it doesn't really matter, you know. God raised Jesus from the dead as the supreme message of heaven, right? The supreme message of heaven. Lots of messiahs were crucified, and lots of people went around saying, we have a messiah, and he was crucified. Nobody had one who they said, he's risen from the dead, we have eyewitnesses, we have verbal accounts, and it can be proved. The great coup d'etat of God in the world was the resurrection of Jesus. Life from the dead, bringing an end to the old and a beginning of the new. And the truth is that this hub in Christ, what we're invited into is a resurrection experience where we are supposed to expect not to be crucified, but to have life from the dead. Because if we continued in Galatians 5, he said, here's the best thing to do, crucify the flesh. If you want to crucify something... Don't crucify people, right? Leave them alone. Crucify the flesh. Understand it's better if you take that thing that's doing all that nonsense towards you and you crucify it. You say, do you know what? I'm going to put this on a cross. Because what you enter into then is the coup d'etat of that whole experience which is resurrection life. I believe in life from the dead. I believe the whole message of the gospel is dead things come alive. It's triumph over the grave. It's conquering the weakness and the addictions and the compulsions and all that nonsense and saying, but into that, it's not saying stop all this and just be empty until you die and go to heaven, whatever that means. He's saying, no, within all that, understand that as you put this in place, you will pull the kingdom of God into the center. If you put those spokes on Christ, it's all going to be stable and fixed, and it won't collapse under pressure, but it will take you where you need to go in the motion of life. So, if you have fully put your faith and trust in Christ as the hub, of your life and existence, you will experience the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God being pulled into you through the spokes of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And I cannot stress to you enough, this hit me like a brick between the eyes. Against such there is no law. Against such there is no law. That means that once you hit this, it is not subject to laws that normally would be the overruling factor that would control your situation. Against this, against these things, there is no law. So as we live in the cycle of the fruit of the Spirit, I believe that the end is actually assured. I want you to bring the movement of your life into the context of the wheel of time where Christ is the hub and the spokes are connected to, from, and in that hub, so that your life, as it moves, moves along those lines from everlasting to everlasting, everlasting love, everlasting joy, everlasting peace, all flowing and working in your life. Now, here's what I think. Very often we can perceive the context of, of time, and maybe even of the kingdom of God being there, and some can because it doesn't take a lot of, a lot of philosophical uh, cleverness to understand how love, joy, peace, and all those things might be good spokes in life. But actually, the ingredient in there that really matters is the hub. What's your life centered on? If your life's actually centered on nothing, then you can have all the love, joy, peace you like in the world, but it won't give strength to the wheel because they can't work in the way they're supposed to work. So you will have crooked lines in a crooked world. But it's the hub in place that provides the strength for the wheel that proves the thesis. Here's my point. Put Christ at the center. 
So how do you do that? Well, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because it's like, how do you fully explain that in a context? Putting Christ at the center is actually, it's the decision of the heart. It's the decision of the mind and the spirit that says, yeah, I, I, I," and it's actually something you receive more than something you create. It's something that you accept more than something that you strive for. It's Christ at the center because if there is any truth to this whole story of the gospel, then it's the truth of God's incredible desire for Christ to be right at the center, the kingdom of God within you, allowing these spokes to be attached in a way that is constantly pulling the kingdom of God, pulling the kingdom of God, pulling the kingdom of God. I think that's why in my life I've experienced so many healings and provisions and blessings and helps and and through some of the most awful circumstances, seen a revelation of the goodness and kindness of God. I haven't always done it very well, and my wheel's been buckled more than once. But the more Christ is at the center, and the more the spokes are connected to that core, the more they pull the kingdom into our life, and that's my desire for you tonight. Let's just pray for a moment. We said earlier, there's, there's two nows. There's, there's your now and there's God's now. And uh, I think the your now is the wheel without the hub. That's why it's so vulnerable to these things distorting and the wheel buckling. I think God's now is, is the Christ-centered position in life and uh, I think we have a lot of power in life I think we have a tremendous power of, of choice and, and so I'm going to pray in a moment but what, what I invite you to do is this because uh, I think it's very powerful in its own right is, is if you decide and make a choice that Christ is going to be the centre in an amazing wonderful way something incredible happens Some, something Something takes place, something, something spirit comes alive on the inside of you. And uh, I want that for every one of you. I want, I want you to be living in this space. I want us as a house to be living in this space. This is very much an ethos of community that I am proposing for each one of us. But I want you to be in it. That Christ be at the center. So just, just take a moment now. Just... Just that you in your heart say, God, I want to put Christ right at the center of the wheel of time of my life so that as these spokes work for me and as I work within these spokes of love and peace and gentleness and all those things that they consistently are pulling the kingdom, pulling the kingdom, pulling the kingdom into my life. That's the experience, I believe, that Jesus was talking about when he said, I want you to pray your kingdom come your will be done here on earth in a flesh environment within the context of time just like it is in heaven, that kingdom coming. So right now, let it come, Father. I pray for every heart, every life, every person. Right now, we're just thinking these things through and making confessions to you and asking of you for this experience. I thank you right now, Father, that you said you give it to whoever asks. Just let it come, I pray. Let it come fully, completely. I pray more than just technically, let it be seen experientially of this wonderful pulling the kingdom in because against such there is no law. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, lovely. So we're going to sing one more song. We'll, we'll receive the... We'll receive the offering to pay it forward. And uh, then if you've got kids to collect, make sure you collect your own. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all The Rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support The Rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.